Good evening. And as joyful as I am to see you, our Lord Jesus Christ on the altar is infinitely more joyful because he has treasured you from the very beginning of time. And uh, yesterday I spoke to you about those things that our Lord wants us to have a holy indifference about. So there are those things that are blessings, they're good things, but we have a holy detachment from them because, well, God could use them to help us get to heaven, but they aren't essential. God could use something else to get us to heaven. So it's good to enjoy the blessings of God, but we always remember to love the giver who is God himself the most, the one who loves us most tenderly, more than all of his creation could love us put together. So so tonight, I'm going to speak to you about the things in God's divine plan, his divine providence, that God wants us to pursue, the things that will lead us to God, the things that matter, the things that are most important, the things that we should be choosing in this life. So essentially, I'm going to bring it down to one thing in a nutshell, and it's called grace. Grace is everything. If we die in a state of grace, we get to heaven, our eternal destiny. If we die without grace, we don't. So grace is the most important treasure that we have in this world. And this grace we call uh, a share in God's own life. We receive this grace in baptism. It is our relationship with the Blessed Trinity. It is a supernatural life in God. So grace does not make us God himself, but it makes us like God. And it makes us sons and daughters of God. And so as we live on earth, so we attain everlasting life. If we live in grace, then we attain everlasting life. Grace is a foretaste of heaven. Because like I said before, um, God doesn't just give us good things in heaven. God himself is our reward in heaven. So the more in love we are with God in grace, now the more assured we are of heaven and the greater reward we get in heaven. So really it is a matter of grace or non-grace. And may we all die with grace. That's the most important thing. What will help us? to grow in grace. That is what we want to pursue. Those are the things that God wants us to want. Those are the things that God loves. We love what God loves. So I'll begin with uh, the reading from the Beatitudes again. So if you could please stand for the gospel. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord. Seeing the crowds, he went up to the mountain. And when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. 
Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when men revile you and persecute you and utter all kind of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven. For so men persecuted the prophets who were before you. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall have their fill. Now, I, I think of these words, and they're so consoling to me because it's a promise. If I ask for my grandmother's health, Jesus says he can grant my prayer, but he may desire her to be in heaven with him. So his answer just might be no. But his no is better than my yes. Because ultimately, God's answer is always the best, and it brings those whom he loves to heaven. But he can say no. If I ask for a job, he can say no. If I ask to uh, have a successful mission, he can say no. But if I hunger and thirst for righteousness, I will be filled. So if we truly hunger and, right to, uh, hunger and thirst for the right thing, God will fill us to the brim. So what we ask for really matters. And what we're asking for, what we're hungering for, is grace. A deeper growth in divine grace. Lord, grant me whatever helps me to do your will best. If we act that prayer with sincerity, he will give it to us. Both blessings and crosses. But if we are faithful, he will assure that we grow in divine grace, and he will fulfill our thirst and our hunger. He guarantees we'll have it if we are truly sincere in asking for the right thing. I'm going to read a passage to you from St. Paul to the Romans. Indeed, only with difficulty does one die for a just person. Though perhaps for a good person, one might even find the courage to die. But God proves his love for us in that when we were still sinners, Christ died for us. When we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Isn't it such a beautiful thing to meditate on the fact that we are treasured by God. Put my health aside, put my job aside, put the food on my table aside, my family aside, whatever. The fact that I have God's love, unless I reject it, I have it in abundance. And it is more wealth than all of creation. And it's guaranteed. God waits for me to love him back. And he treasures us. And he holds us dear to his heart. And when we think about that, how refreshing. So that no matter where we are in our life, if we have committed great sins, We can have hope in his forgiveness because he already moves us to be sorry. He moves us to repentance. So the treasure is there. And if we don't repent, it's not because he doesn't love us. It's because we keep pushing it away. So if we really want to consider 
all that we have, we already have wealth beyond measure and being loved by God. And the saints meditated on this and they were joyful about it because they felt filled to the brim with God's love. They were thrilled with it. And what is amazing, as St. Paul points out, is that God loved us even while we were sinners. Even while we were sons and daughters of wrath, God chose to love us. And his love was so great that he gave his only begotten son not only to take our human flesh and to walk our walk and experience our emotions, shed our tears, sweat our sweat, and suffer our sufferings. He chose to pull out all the stops and he suffered till he could bleed no more out of love. And he's still here, body, blood, soul, and divinity in the Holy Eucharist, loving us, treasuring us. If you and I, if our souls experience truly the fullness, in its fullness, the treasure of God's love for our soul, we would die of love. So if there's any time we're feeling sad or discouraged or worried about whether he will forgive us, always remember this. God out of love created you and out of love redeemed you creation and new creation. And this very day, no matter where you stand in life, he treasures you and he created you for himself so that you could be eternally united with him forever. And God is love. That should always spur us on forward. And sometimes in our prayer, and that's why we should be praying every day, because we can reflect upon this truth. But even if we feel it or don't feel it, it doesn't matter. We know by faith he does. That's the beauty of our Catholic faith, is that we know that God created us because he loved us, and he's holding us in being, and he's giving us opportunity for grace all the time, because he treasures us. And that is what moves us forward. That's what gives us hope. That's what gives us joy. That's what strengthens our faith. And that's what helps us to love even the least of his brothers and sisters. Because we are convinced of God's love for us. We just swell with joy knowing that we are treasured. And it just spills out. An author who wrote a story about St. Margaret Mary Alacoc, he says, oh love, to be appreciated by someone, to be, to be respected by someone, to, uh, to be treasured by someone important, oh, what refreshment but to be treasured by God himself. How infinitely more so. So think of yourself as being treasured by the best of people and multiply that by a million. You are treasured by the supreme being. And then we go and we think, I want to be something like that. I want to return love for love. So the incarnation and the paschal mystery, beautiful mysteries. None can claim that God does not love him. This knowledge of love, God's love for us should spur us on to generosity. Because we are treasured, let us spread the treasure to others so that they can find hope is also even to the least of our brethren. Father Gabriel and St. Mary Magdalene write this meditation from the silent 
loving contemplation of the infant Jesus, there is easily aroused in us a more profound and penetrating sense of his infinite love. We no longer merely believe, but in a certain way we experience God's love for us. Then our will fully accepts what faith teaches. It accepts it with love, with all its strength, and our soul believes unreservedly, unreservedly in God's infinite love. A soul who believes in infinite love will know how to give itself to God without measure, to give itself totally. So God created us out of nothing. We have our natural life through this creation and through the participation of our parents. But then God redeemed us. God gave us the life of grace. Remember that word? Grace, it's everything. He gave us this internal relationship with the Blessed Trinity through baptism. And he filled us with this grace. And this grace is a supernatural life. And we should guard it with our life. The king, uh, the mother of King St. Louis IX, who was in the Crusades, when he was a little boy, his mother used to tell him, my son, I love you dearly, but I would rather see you a corpse than to see you commit a single mortal sin. See, if we're, those are hard words. But if we die a natural life, it's just a natural death. But if we fall from the life of grace, as long as we're in that state, we can't make it to heaven. That's eternal life. So falling from grace really is worse than dying. So we should treasure that gift of grace that Jesus Christ gives us and do anything we can to keep it alive. So what do we pursue in this life? What does God want us to be hungry and thirsty for? Anything that strengthens or keeps this life of grace. Sacrament, Holy Mass, prayer, the practice of virtue, good works, doing works of charity for others, keeping the commandments, spiritual reading, holy thoughts, forgiveness of others. These things are what God wants us to pursue in his divine providence. These things are what God wants us to want. Everything else is secondary. I might be in very good health, but that's secondary to the life of grace in my soul. So grace is everything. Grace is everything. It is our love for God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And it is our, our love for our neighbor as ourselves. We can take grace with us when we die, but we can't take anything else, right? So we want to keep that treasure of grace to bring it with us. Father Gabriel gives us a meditation on this grace. He says, Jesus explained his mission work in these words. I am come that they may have life and may have it more abundantly. What is this life which he gives us? It is a life of grace, which is a participation in his divine life. And he continues, the sanctifying grace which fills the soul of Jesus is so plentiful, so perfect, intense, and superabundant that the theologians do not hesitate to call it infinite grace. But Jesus does not wish to keep all this immense wealth for himself alone. He wishes to have brethren with whom, whom he can share it. He wants us to share in his grace. Isn't that beautiful? To share in the life of God? What an honor. Sanctifying grace is not something that's external to us. Sanctifying grace is life within us. 
so that we can grow in it. And in our natural life, we are alive or we're dead, right? And I think everyone in this church is alive. Thank you, Jesus. But there's varying levels in between, right? We can be very healthy. We can be pretty healthy. We can be somewhat healthy. We can be, well, not quite so healthy. And we can be at gate death. Okay, there's all kinds of stages in the life of, of the natural life. It's the same way with sanctifying grace. We can be spiritually healthy and on fire and want to spread this love of God to the whole world without consideration of what people think. Or we can be pretty fervent. Or we can be somewhat fervent. Or we can be lukewarm. Or we can just show up on Sundays at Mass because we have to. Or we can just be uh, very close to mortal sin because we're just not really interested in God at all. Okay, so there's all these various levels of grace too. Now, where do you want to be in this divine grace? You want to be intense in it, don't you? You want to be on fire. You want to be so close to God that no suffering discourages you. Oh, it didn't mean that we don't cry. Our Lady of Sorrows suffered at the foot of the cross, and I'm sure she wept greatly. But she still had this mysterious joy because she knew that she's doing God's will. And so this woman we call Our Lady of Sorrows also has great faith, hope, and love. And she is on fire. Don't you and I want to be like her and like all the angels and saints? Grace that we receive in baptism is like a packed seed, like a mustard seed, right? When we have this life of grace, if we feed it with the things that I told you about, prayer, virtue, holy thoughts, mass, whatever, we feed that life of grace, then it grows, and it grows, and it grows. And then pretty soon it's contagious. It brings the life of Jesus Christ to others. Others are inspired by the holiness of the saint. Mother Teresa, this little short nun with gnarly feet, all crinkled up. Have you ever seen a picture of her feet? She walked barefoot everywhere, and her feet were dried up. And yet everyone was, was moved by this holy woman. She was a powerhouse of prayer and full of virtue. And when I think of Mother Teresa, I get excited. When I think of Padre Pio, I get excited because these people loved, and they were on fire. And they loved grace. They loved the life that God gave them in baptism. And they didn't go backward. They always went forward. Grace isn't just something that covers us up. Grace isn't just like snow over a pile of dirt. No, grace changes us. It's life in us. It makes us holy as Jesus is holy. And that is why God commanded you must be holy as I, the Lord your God, am holy. So when we experience this life of grace and we know what we need to pursue to make it grow, then we have a choice. We either go forward, we go backward. It's like paddling up a stream in a canoe. Okay, the minute we take up the paddle and we put our hands behind our back and lay back on the seat of the canoe. We go back, right? So there is no standstill. Okay, I think I'm holy enough about where I am. I don't need to do any more. Well, love doesn't do that. Love just always wants to press forward. Love wants to love more. So we grow and we grow and we struggle. 
And that's what this life of grace is all about. Have you ever heard of the bird called the albatross? Please raise your hand if you heard the bird albatross. Okay. So you know what that bird is. I've seen it on the movie called The Rescuer, a Walt Disney movie. Very clumsy bird, okay? So this albatross is like the plane which the mice get on, and he takes off and he flies terrible. And then he comes in for a crash landing, okay? So here's what the albatross does. When they flap their wings, and they're jumping up and down, they're flapping, and nothing seems to happen. They're like chickens. They can't fly very well. And then the wind comes, and they begin to soar. And they fly. And then they're going for a crash landing. <laughs> I think sometimes that is what our spiritual life is like. We have to understand that grace isn't just something that makes us uh, saints immediately. Yes, we are saints in the fact that we have the life of grace in our soul. We're turned on like a light bulb, okay? But it's up to us to help to grow in that, okay? So God didn't just snippety snap make us, okay, you're St. Padre Pio now. No, we have, we have to do all that work that goes to it, right? It takes effort. So we're like that albatross, and we flap, and we jump, and we flap, and we do everything we can. We make our resolutions, we try to overcome our sin, we try to practice detachment, and we just, it doesn't seem like we're getting anywhere, and all of a sudden, we say, God, help me. And God, through the wind of his grace, picks us up, and then we do well. We're like Peter, who walks on water. But then what happens to Peter when he takes his eyes off Christ? He thinks. What happens when the albatross, while the wind's not there anymore? He crashes, right? We can do that in our spiritual life too, and we often do. But what do we do? We flap our wings again. We keep flapping and kicking. We keep praying. We keep making resolutions, and we refuse to be discouraged with our foes or our faults or our sins because we're in love. So we sin, we go to confession, our Lord revives us with his grace, and we, we're set on course again. And we just keep going, pushing and shoving, and keep going forward. There's no time for uh, laziness. Just keep working at it, okay? We do this because we're in love with God. We're in love with the treasure that he gives to our soul. We cooperate with God's love. So our faith, our salvation, depends on two things. First, it depends on his grace. Without his grace, we can do nothing. I am the vine, you are the branches. Without me, you can do nothing. We need Jesus Christ in our soul. We need his life of grace in our soul. But it's not a free ticket. Okay, you're in grace, so you don't have to worry about it anymore. You'll never fall from the state of grace. Mm. No, we have to make our efforts to cooperate with his grace, and we strive to be saints. We strive to be holy. One day at a time, we try to be patient, but we work at it. We work and we work. And with God's grace and our cooperation with God's grace, he brings us to everlasting life. What a treasure. What a treasure. And you know, it makes perfect sense. Why would I want an easy ticket to heaven? Love is worth a struggle, isn't it? I mean, if I'm willing to sacrifice myself a little bit so that my love grows, isn't that worth it? Instead of just expecting an easy ticket, why would I want an easy ticket? If the one who loved me so much went through that for me, died for me, with excruciating pain between two thieves, humiliating for me, would I not want to struggle 
to remain faithful to the life of grace in my soul? Love for love, right? Love for love. So that is why St. James says, For just as a body without a spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. And why St. Paul says to the Philippians, So then, my beloved, obedient as you have, have, you have always been, not only when I am present, but all the more now when I am absent. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And some of the fathers of the early church, some of the saints have said this, the God who created you without your help will not save you without your help. So this Lent, my brothers and sisters, let us take great encouragement in the love that God has for us. And let us cooperate with that love and not settle for lukewarm spirituality, but strive for holiness, strive to be like Jesus, strive to forgive, strive to love as our Lord loved, work on overcoming our faults. The more we do so, the closer to the sacred heart of Jesus we become. And the less we do, the weaker in grace we become and the easier to lose grace. So it's one way or the other. You and I, we're going forward. We're going forward because we love. Remember, help comes from Jesus. We can't do it alone, but with, help, with his help, we can do all things. Love creates saints. Love creates saints. Love always makes things a little easier. And that is why Jesus, who says, deny yourself daily, take up your cross and follow me, also says, come to me, all you who are burdened, and I will give you rest, for my yoke is easy and my burden light. It's not easy getting up in the middle of the night from your beloved sleep, but when your child is sick and they need a mother or father's care, it's easier to get up in the middle of the night out of love. The infinite love and the strength that Jesus gives us makes our burden easier. He is with us, and he is our strength. Let us be generous. Let us follow Jesus' example. Love one another as I love you. So examples of being more generous in charity. Well, not complaining when things don't go my way. Not holding a grudge against my neighbor, but forgiving him and praying for him. By giving more time to pray before the Blessed Sacrament. By spending less time in front of TV and doing works of charity, such as visiting the elderly. There's countless ways to grow in charity. Uh, have you ever heard of Matthew Kelly's book, Holy Moments? Okay, I like that. When we're in grace, we try to make holy moments with people. And there's countless ways to do it. Okay, smiling at someone, even if you don't feel like smiling, is a holy moment. Okay, when we are in a state of grace, everything that we do for him becomes valuable, becomes holy. So by our example of Christian love, the world should see that love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, and that love never fails. And let's remember, when we love, he is never outdone in generosity. He loves us more. I read a book about a monk in Gethsemane in Kentucky. And the book said something like this. Um, the man who got even with God. Okay, so the idea was that he saw God's many blessings upon him. And so he himself tried to become a saint to try to get even with God. So there's no way we can ever get even with God because whatever we give, he gives us a hundred times more back. But we can try to get even with God. 
We can try to be a saint. We can try to be Mother Teresa, Padre Pio. Let us not settle for the bare minimal. Love goes beyond just the fear of hell. I don't want to be good just because I'm afraid of going to hell. That's not fervent love. I want to do good because I'm in love with God. St. Therese, the little flower, says this, fear makes me shrink while under love's sweet rule I not only advance, I fly. I fly. Anthony Castle quotes an anonymous person who told this following story. And this is what I close with. In one of the terrible concentration camps of the Second World War, there was a Polish priest called Father Kolbe. He had been put there because he had published comments about the Nazi regime. One of the prisoners escaped from the camp, and the camp commandant, to punish the prisoners, ordered 10 of them to be starved to death. Among the prisoners was a young man who had a wife and children. And when the prisoners' numbers were called out, Father Colby stepped forward and insisted on taking the young man's place. He's willing to die instead of him. In the death cell, Father Colby helped the others prepare for death. He gave them little treats, whatever he had. He prayed the rosary with them. They sang hymns. He was the last to die. And because he had taken too long, they injected poison in his arm. After his death, if you had gone to his cell, you would have seen a picture of Jesus on the cross, scratched on the wall with his nails. A man in a very desperate situation, and yet filled with the love of God. That inspires me. Where did that come from? Where did that come from? Here he is. He's here for you and me. He's here for us to indulge in that life of grace that he has given us. He is here for us to love and to get even with God. This has been a wonderful experience for me being with you. You all inspire me. I thank you so much for inviting us to do this parish mission with you. Um, I see much devotion here. I'm so inspired to see the perpetual adoration always being visited. I see rosaries hanging on hooks and people using them. I see statues, I see religious pictures, I see everything that points this direction. And I see a great love of our Lord in your hearts. So I beg you, keep it alive, and don't just keep it alive, grow in it, share it with others, Remain a steadfast parish because in these days, we need it. We need a light in the darkness. The world needs to see Jesus in you. Thank you for coming. I've been very inspired. Uh, again, I will be available for confession, but first, after the benediction, I would just like the opportunity to say goodbye to you. I'll be at the reception for a little while, but then I'll be in the confessional again for as many people as there are or, um, that would like to go to confession, okay? God bless you, and God bless you, Father Bowden, and God bless you, Father Paul. I know you're hiding back there, but thank you all very much for uh, a wonderful, wonderful mission. Um, God bless you.